You, you ready? Perfect, right on time. So uh, round of applause for Lucy, and she's going to be talking about DevOps and distributing DevOps for Fun and Profit. Yes. Hello, uh, thanks all for coming. Um, uh, so my name's Lucy. Um, one of the, well, we, my team at work does a bunch of things. Uh, we maintain a bunch of services and platforms and tools that the rest of the developers use. And um, one of those is a thing uh, called PSCLI or Piscally, which is a CLI we've written in Go uh, that basically I like to think of it as a user experience layer uh, for launching a bunch of Docker containers containing tools that the developers want to use. Um, so, I'm gonna, before I talk to you about this tool, uh, I need to give you a little bit of brief background about where it came from, because uh, it didn't just spring out of nowhere. I'm uh, going to talk to you about um, how it started becoming really, really useful when we made this uh, CLI in Go, and then talk a bit about how we've started open sourcing it, because this is Fosdem after all. So, in the beginning, the problem we had that we needed to solve was new starters at the company, we needed a way of giving them a single thing that they could install and run all the tools they needed. Uh, we didn't like the idea of giving them a document saying, install this, configure this, here's some settings. No, we wanted them to have a single thing that would, for the most part, just work. And our initial solution to that was a vagrant image uh, that contains a bunch of stuff. Uh, and that worked for a while, but as the company grew bigger, that wasn't really a sustainable solution. Uh, for a start, teams across the company are sort of semi-autonomous, and what that means for us is that while they might use the same tools, they didn't necessarily use the same versions of those tools, uh, which for us meant uh, potentially different versions of VMs for different teams, which is not a sustainable solution. Uh, these things are fairly big, uh, which annoys developers when they have to download a new one. And they take a long time to build, which is not a problem in and of itself because you automate that, but it means that the testing cycles when we create new versions of this are really awkward. But the biggest problem with this uh, was that it took ages to start up and for developers to update to the newer versions of these, uh, which basically meant that they didn't. <laughs> and a lot of the issues that they saw is to due to having old versions of stuff and not having the same version on their laptops as on CI. So about this point in the timeline when we were getting bored of this, uh, Docker for Mac uh, came out of beta and one of our team came up with a brilliant idea of why don't we just replace this VM with Docker? And that looked like this, which yeah, it works, uh, but that's not a thing that we want to give to our developers. Um, I mean, getting developers to update a VM every now and then is awkward enough. Making sure people are running exactly this and making sure hundreds of people across the company are running exactly this is not going to happen. So while this worked in our team and it did everything that the VM did, we needed a better way of distributing it which is where Go comes in. So we created a tool called PSCLI, uh, which is written in Go. Uh, it interacts with Docker SDK, uh, same code that the Docker client uses. Uh, it uses Cobra and Viper to wrap stuff up into a nice CLI that the developers can just run. And there's a lot of nice, nice library code that we've got in there as well uh, that we can run prior to launching a container. So some of the nice features we get out of this, um, it's able to update itself. Uh, so developers previously updating that VM was a pain. Uh, in this case, it's just one command and it updates. Uh, tools that are run with this uh, run against whatever is in your current directory. So you don't have to clone your code twice, once for outside your VM, once for inside it. But another feature we've been able to add to this is that it's able to run without needing your code to be in your current directory. It's able to run against a Git repo, which it stores in a Sidekick data container, which in CI is helpful. <laughs> Another thing that's useful for that is that you can, there's a parameter that we've added to it that lets you use a remote Docker server. But all of that's not 
particularly interesting on its own because there's lots of things that do that. Um, and the, the reason I think that this became incredibly popular at, at my company uh, is that uh, we are able to add arbitrary code prior to launching a container. Some of the things that we do fairly frequently in this tool uh, include uh, authenticating a user with uh, Vault, uh, which lets us get access to secrets that the container might need. Uh, an example of that is anything that needs access to AWS, uh, we use Vault to generate uh, short-lived credentials, which our security team loves us for, because now there's no excuse, for the most part, for long-lived IAM users. But it also lets us do nice little things, little user experience things, uh, stuff that in workshops I've noticed people make mistakes or find frustrating, like if they've not configured Git or if they've not got an SSH key so they can't clone anything from Bitbucket yet. This will detect whether they've got that and prompt them, tell them what they need to do so they don't have to ask, why is this broken? Because it'll tell you. And then once we had this tool, um, and basically all the developers had it, we realized that by accident we managed to distribute a thing that lets us run any code that doesn't require containers at all. So there's a bunch of stuff in here that doesn't even use containers at all. But one of the most interesting things that we've found by using this uh, is we've got anonymous usage statistics in this. So we know which versions of this tool people are using. We know uh, what people are running with this. Uh, so we found out recently uh, that 25% of people in the past month are using the latest version of this, and a further 35% are within a few patch versions of it, which was unheard of back when we had a VM that took 45 minutes to update. So I'm going to show off a couple of things that we have in this. Uh, can I get our friendly neighborhood mic stand? Right. I feel like I should make people pay for this. I'll pay you in stickers. So, some of the stuff in here, um, so most of the stuff in here requires access to the work network, so disclaimer, I'm faking some of that. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's built in Cobra, so some of the stuff we get for free includes uh, tab completion. Uh, so some of the commands that are included in this, there's a lot of them, most of them running containers. A uh, bunch of global flags that are common to everything. Uh, I mentioned this thing has the ability to update itself, so there's two commands that are part of this. Uh, first one, PSC live version, tells you which version you're running, uh, and checks Artifactory, where we store all the Go binaries for this. Check if there's a new version, and PSC live update, updates you in place of the new version. Uh, the Incontrievable Go Updates library is pretty good for that. So, oh no, I'm on 7.0.0. That's not the latest version. Let's fix that. And now I'm on the latest version. That's like significantly quicker than updating a VM. So what else? Uh, I've gone with a very complicated example of one of the containers that we run in here, but it's a fairly common thing we do in this tool. Uh, in this case, this is the AWS shell, which is something that Amazon provides uh, as a wrapper around their CLI. But the reason I'm using this is because it is an example of us authenticating the user with Vault, getting secrets, getting a list of all the accounts they have access to, generating credentials, and then at that point it knows what it needs to do to launch a container. So it launches the container, binds your AWS directory, which contains the credentials, and also contains the history that this tool needs. Uh, so I'll show you what that looks like. So if I say Piscally AWS shell, first it prompts me for my LDAP credentials, and that's definitely my real username, password hunter2. How are you typing? Magic. I'm psychic. So there's all the list of accounts that I have access to. Uh, I pick the dev account. Uh, I say I want admin access to the account. So it's going to download the Docker image. This was recorded at a slightly higher resolution. So that normally looks better than that. But then at this point, I'm in the container. And I just press up. And that's the last command I ran, last time I had this container on my laptop. 
In this case, it's just checking the content of a particular S3 bucket. But yeah, so that's an example of what launching a container using this thing looks like. Sure, a uh, question? Uh, yes, those come from Vault as well. Uh, so the question was uh, when it shows the list of roles, uh, where do those come from? And yes, those are one of the features of HashiCorp Vault as well. So that's where that comes from, as well as the list of accounts. Uh, so another example, um, so Terraform, this is something we use to manage our infrastructure's code. Uh, and this is one of the things that teams across the company like using, but they are not necessarily on the latest version. So HashiCorp has a fairly frequent release cycle, which means that when they release a new version, it's not necessarily backwards compatible. Uh, so, we, so if I do... In fact, I am going to need my Mac stand because this one is one that requires me to actually type. So if I ask it which version I'm currently running, uh, I'm on 0.11.1. Uh, oh, one. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> Two hands typing is easier. Uh, I can also ask it what versions are available. Uh, so those are the versions that we've added over time. Uh, and if I, can, if I specify that I want a specific version, uh, it'll use that. So yeah, and that applies to basically anything in there. Uh, but this uh, particular command, uh, this is one I use a lot in the workshops, and I've seen the frustrations people have. So I've added some nice usability stuff to this. Uh, when you saw the list of accounts, um, for example, anything in this tool that uses AWS, uh, you can specify the account as a flag, but you can also use a config file. And by default, it will check for a config file in your current directory, or it'll check for one in your home directory if it can't find it. And also, because we manage all the AWS accounts, we know which roles exist. So I'll show you what this looks like. Um, here we go. So have a look in the config file. It says that the code that exists in this directory corresponds to that particular account. So if I run this in debug mode to get some more logging, so what we see? Um, we see that it uses this config file from a current directory. It's chosen to use that account. Uh, because we know how this tool works and we know which roles are available in each account, uh, we know that plan only requires read-only access, so it drops me down from admin, which I chose earlier, down to read-only. And the rest is basically the same sort of thing, runs this in a container. In this case, it's just some test DNS records, so that's not particularly interesting. So that's that part. I said this is open source. Um, and Basically, this tool has sort of become the victim of its own success at work. Uh, people have been asking us, can you add this other tool to it? Uh, and we've been thinking, yeah, that's a useful thing to do in something like this. Um, but that's more stuff that we have to maintain. And we don't want to maintain lots of things. We want to maintain a small number of things. So there's some refactoring work we needed to do with this anyway. So we, instead of um, just refactoring that in place, uh, we split out uh, some of it. So while there's a lot of cool, cool stuff in PSCLI, uh, at its heart, it's a thing which runs Docker containers and functions in a nice CLI. So what we've done, uh, we've abstracted away uh, the Cobra and Viper and the Docker SDK stuff that uh, is part of PSCLI, and put that into the open source Kelly. Um, this lets us do stuff like setting sensible defaults. Like We basically know that anything that will be written with this would want the opportunity to run from your current directory or from a Git repo, possibly in a remote Docker, stuff like that. But the philosophy behind this is that while we are doing stuff by default, uh, we want to let people access native Docker stuff and use that preference if they have special stuff that they want to do. So demo time again. So I've got a version that uses this um, called Loosely, named after myself because I'm vain. Um, so I'll show you what one of these things looks like. So main's not that interesting, so I'll show you the root uh, package. Uh, first thing it does, uh, I'm defining CLI variable, which is available to all the other commands in this. Uh, new CLI, I'm calling it Loosely. Setting an init function, which just sets short and long descriptions. So that does the help text stuff. I could do all sorts of stuff here. I could define a bunch of global flags, but 
for this demo, that's all I need. So if I run this, it'll show me all the tools available into it. And a bunch of global flags, so Docker host again, a bunch of stuff for interacting with Git repos if I want to. And yeah, so I've got, so showing, before I show you how this thing launches containers, I'm going to show you how it does simple functions. Um, so my version function, I've got, so from my CLI, I'm defining a new subcommand version, uh, which just prints out which version we're running. Uh, I define a function that just prints out a bunch of variables from my, from my uh, version library, which I set at build time when I compile the binaries. <coughs> and then the task, uh, which is the run function of this uh, command, um, just runs this function. So if I do, it tells me it's running 031. Uh, that global debug flag, um, where is it? If I specify that, we can see a bit more information when it was built, uh, which git commit it was built from. Terraform again, I'm going to use this as an example, mostly because I really like Terraform. And I use this myself uh, to manage my live DNS records. So what does this one look like? This one is slightly more complicated. This one actually does use a Docker container. So again, command is a new command from this CLI. I'm setting Okay. Yeah. No, it Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Fantastic. It didn't work like one You may sit time. down. <laughs> so, uh, yes, yeah, so in this case, defining a new command off my CLI. Short description shows up in the main um, help uh, text. Long description shows up when I ask for help text for this tool specifically. Uh, and I'm defining a flag. And in Kali, uh, which is the open source version of this, um, a flag corresponds to a Cobra flag, and it also corresponds to a Viper config. So I can specify this profile field both when I'm running my tool and in my config file. And you saw what that looked like when I did that with Terraform earlier. Um, so I'm defining my task for this, uh, which in this case is a string, uh, which Kali interprets to be a Docker image. So by default, it will download this image and just run it. I'm also defining an init function, which happens first. Uh, in this case, it just takes the value of that profile flag and passes that in as an environment variable. So I'm going to show you a bit about what that looks like. So I'm going to use a Git repo for this. This is a private repo that only I have access to, so it's going to use my SSH key to, to clone this. And I'll use the same commands as I did before, plan. In this case, I've previously cloned this, so this uh, sidekick container still exists. It's just checked whether it's up to date, which it is. And it's going to check if my DNS records are up to date, uh, which I think last time I did this, they weren't. But I'm not changing live DNS records in the middle of a demo. So let's leave that. And another one, this is the simplest possible example I could come up with for running a container in this. Uh, I'm using Vim, just because I like Vim. So the command for this looks like this. So all I'm doing, defining a new command off my CLI, setting the task to this image. And I could have just stopped there. I could have used uh, an Alpine image uh, with Vim installed. But of course, this is not normal Vim. This is Vim plus all my configs, all my plugins. Uh, it's even got Go format in it, which means when I save it, the Vim Go plugin will automatically format that for me because there's no way I will write Go code that doesn't automatically do that for me. So yeah, um, there's a lot of stuff that I could do with this. I could rewrite the entirety of what we've got in PSCLI using this if I wanted to. And why will at some point? Uh, I've got a dedicated 10% of my time at work that will be doing that. 
But for now, uh, that's probably all I have time for. Uh, so I've explained where we come from uh, with these massive VMs um, that weren't particularly scalable. I've explained where we are now with uh, PSCLI being this CLI that runs Docker images. And I've shown you a bit about what the future holds for us um, with Kali as this um, abstraction, that this library that we can just use anywhere we want to make a tool like this. Uh, links to source code on screen now, the Kali library itself, uh, my loosely example. Uh, there's another one that I don't have time to demo today that someone in our company has made in the past uh, two weeks. Uh, thank you, Alice. Uh, this is called Statically, uh, and it's what a couple of us are using to manage our uh, technology blog at the moment. And of course, Ashley McNamara's fantastic go for images, without whom this would be a significantly more boring set of slides. So yeah, that's all from me, unless anyone has any questions. Sure. So I say that again. Ah, see that? Right. So the question was how do I make sure that the user inside the container is the same user, uh, user ID as outside the container? And this is something that I deliberately simplified for this talk. Uh, on macOS, it's simple. It doesn't matter, because Docker for Mac makes that simple. On Linux, uh, we do actually have some extra stuff uh, that we need to do. Uh, so I'm figuring out a way of standardizing this in Kali. Uh, we've, it's a solved problem that we already have solved at work, which is you just pipe in the user ID and, and user group ID as environment variables. And then you have something in your entry point uh, which makes uh, uh, make sure that the user IDs match. Uh, it's not particularly nice, but it works. Uh, That's not safe. Is, is it? So the the statement was that that's not particularly secure uh, because you can just pass in any environment variable you want. Uh, and yeah, that's true. Uh, it's not. Great. It's, not, it's the solution we have at the moment. We need a better solution in future, but that's what we're working with for now. Anyone else? Uh, just one question about the volumes. Sure. So the question was, uh, how do we decide um, how, where to mount the volumes from, right? Um, so stuff like uh, the .aws directory with the credentials and your other stuff in there, uh, we work on the assumption that those are stored uh, relative to the user's home directory at the moment. Uh, we haven't found anyone at work that stores them anywhere else. If we do, then we'll add something to make that configurable. Um, Everything else, uh, stuff that runs from your current directory, we just say use uh, current directory. Um, anything that uses home directory, use that. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. So the question was, when we mount uh, like the current working directory, um, how do we know where to mount that in the image? Uh, and the answer to that is usually that uh, we mount it into a directory usually referred to as usually uh, temp slash temp slash workspace. Uh, and then that is the workspace that we uh, use when we're launching the container. That's usually how we do that. Uh, if we need to do anything special for a particular image, uh, we will configure it per image. But that's the default that we usually go with. Thank you. Oh, and I have stickers for the logo if you want some.
the stickers are, are important. And the stickers will not be on this desk. They will be outside. They will be outside, just so you know. Uh, if you want to give a bunch of stickers and we can pass them around, we can totally do that. <laughs>